six of us right now. We'll see if other people come in. I want to introduce Stacy. Thank you so much for being with us today uh, on behalf of the Ames Free Library. And I want to introduce Stacy Miller. She is a, she has her EDD from Columbia University and she recently wrote her second book called Career Management for Artists. Uh, her first was Starting Your Career as an Artist, uh, which she wrote with Angie Wojak. Um, but this is a continuation because she is very um, observant and right in the middle of all the issues working artists face. And she will talk a little bit about that. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna ask, actually ask us all, I'm gonna unmute everybody but Stacy, And then at the end, at quarter of 11 or so, we will stop and ask questions. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, I will, <laughs> I will. I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna mute Diane, mute. You and whatever you want, stay. Uh, um, it's up to you. Okay, and then Scott, I'm gonna. Did I mute everybody? Thanks. Scott, say something. Wait, do you yeah. want us to be muted or unmuted? I want everybody to be muted. All right, fine. I'm here. You okay. And Moira's okay. Great. Moira, I'm gonna mute. You're muted, and Diane, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, let's go, Stacy. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, um, thank you for asking me, Mary, and, and thank you everyone for coming. This is this is really I'm nervous, <laughs> I have to admit. And uh, um, so this is really nice that this is family and friends. I really appreciate it. Well, actually, all family. Oh, wait so a minute. We've got Lisa Scholes coming in. Ooh, Do you know? Her? No, no. Hold on. Hi, Lisa. Hello. She's, she's in. Okay. But I just see, uh, uh, okay. So she's muted. Let's go. Okay. okay. Thanks, Lisa. Nice to see you. Okay. Marion, thank you for inviting me and thanks for the library for letting me um, present today. I'm really excited too. And um, as you said, I have written another, um, I've written one book on career management and this is my second one. So it's just been published um, in uh, June first, it just came out. And I have to just give you a bit of a caveat to it. It's an academic public publishing company. So the price is a little bit hefty. But I can also send Marion, if anybody's interested, I can send Marion the discount that we get as artists, or as anybody who would like to get the discount. Okay, thank you. Um, well, just to give you a brief um, review of my background, I Graduated, actually, uh, my BFA was it, from Mass College of Art. So I spent many years in Boston, is how I got to know Marion and all her wonderful family um, and her wonderful daughter. And um, um, But I have always been involved in the arts and um, my family was very artistic. It, I, my mother is a writer. She wrote about women explorers in the 19th century and um, my grandmother was a painter and a sculptor and a watercolorist and an enamel. Uh, she made enamels. She just about anything she put her hands to, she could do. So I always grew up with paints and paintbrushes and materials all around me and people talking about either writing or art. So it seemed natural that I would go into this profession or this field rather. Um, but I also um, was passionate about education. So the reason I wrote this book was because um, I've been thinking a lot, I've been teaching for many years at Parsons School of Design, and I also have had um, numerous, um, uh, how can I say, encounters or, or rather workshops, and now I am working at School of Visual Arts as well in, in New York City. Um, and I've watched students go through the system uh, getting their BFAs or their MFAs, and it's been it's 
been a challenge to watch them graduate and then go out into the world and try to create a career in the arts. And so it's my passion to think about how artists can create their lives um, for themselves, how they can create a good life in the creative arts. And um, it's not easy. We basically teach one narrative in schools, and that is the narrative of rich, famous, hit Fifth Avenue, or become, go to Gregosian, or some huge gallery pace. And that's pretty much the only narrative that we unfortunately and sadly feed our students. How can you make it in the art world? And so I've been thinking about it for many years and realizing as I have done, been doing my research that there are many, many, many ways to be an artist in the world. And I think the most important thing for artists now is to be thinking about how to take control of their, their lives as artists, how to really make the decisions that will affect them and create a better life for themselves rather than chasing some enormous um, dream that sometimes really can destroy them. And that's what I have seen, um, unfortunately, in our field. Um, that some really talented artists have thought there's only one way, one path to follow. And if they don't make it, they stop making their artwork or they get really discouraged or bitter or they just stop being invested whatsoever in their, in their creative endeavors, their creative studio work. So these books that I'm trying to, that I'm writing and I'm getting more and more involved in is to really talk about how many different paths there are in this creative field. And these paths can vary tremendously. Um, they're becoming more and more, artists are becoming more and more creative, which is one of the themes of the book as well. Take your creativity from your studio and put it into your career. So you're not just taking the status quo, which is, well, I'm not an artist if I don't make it in a gallery. And I'm not a really good artist if I don't make it in a really big gallery. That to me is a really um, limited way to see your career. So my passion and what I've been trying to write about and what I will continue to write about in hopefully more specific terms is just how many ways there are that you can follow your career path. For example, um, there are a definitely alternative uh, um, spaces for artists. Now, financially, they may not be as great as those, um, those very expensive um, uh, galleries that people try for, but when you work out the finances, actually for these high-end galleries and more open creative spaces that actually give you more control over your work, you find that, yes, you may be making some more money, but you're certainly giving up some of your freedom. And that's what I think artists don't understand. When you make it in a big gallery, so much of the um, proceeds will, uh, much of the proceeds will go into creating the exhibition, into um, doing the PR, into um, taking your time and space away from the studio in order to get um, the right people to buy your work. So when you work out the kind of freedoms you can have in different environments as compared to what you will get from a very high-end gallery, sometimes at least as I look at the as I look at the figures, it's it's not as great as you would seem. It's not like you can really really make a living even off your off a high end gallery with your art. And that's I think a big surprise for artists. Most very high end, um, most very famous artists will have their side gig, as we say, their side gigs for a very 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 long time. It's a very small percentage that can actually leave the workforce and work in their, ga their studios full time. And there's one other thing to take into consideration, which is why um, I really encourage artists to think about alternative ways of, of thinking about their careers, is that once you do get committed into um, a gallery that, you know, will find the right people to buy your work. You're very committed to that particular gallery's way of thinking. 
So often what artists are expected to do is to keep up their, keep a same body of work going. So their creativity gets quite limited. Um, I don't know if this is helpful. I hope it is. <laughs> but um, so a couple more themes um, that go through my book is a very basic theme. And I think this can work for many careers, which is what are your values? What do you value most in your creative life? Like what, what really is, makes a good day in your studio or in your practice, wherever you're doing your practice? Is it at home? Is it in your studio? Is it many um, artists will have small spaces to work in, some will have bigger ones, but what makes a good day for you in the studio? And what does that mean for your values? Because your values will drive your goals. And that's the first step I think all artists need to step back and think about, okay, what do I value? Do I value time? Do I value um, my independence? Do I value um, being able to work in a collaborative environment? Do I value a community over my isolation in the studio? What are all of these qualities that really make you, give you the space to create? And those, I don't think we spend enough of time on. Um, we kind of take for granted that we all have the same values, but I think artists really are very different kinds of people and they have very different kinds of values. Um, we had an experience in our studio, which was really interesting to give you a concrete example. And that was that um, we don't have walls in our studios. It's a wide open garage space. <laughs> it's really wide open. There are no walls. And <laughs> it, um, we had a couple people come through that had a very, very difficult time. And we're talking now very concrete example. I mean, very minute, but it made a huge difference. What we really all figured out is that they needed walls. They needed the door to be open and then they needed to be able to close the door to do their work. But this kind of open collective space was very difficult for them to handle understandably because it is difficult. I have a studio, my little space is, in between two other spaces so everybody walks through my space and i have to say on some days it's tough i'm like oh one more person walking through my space and you know when people walk through your space they always have to say hello and i'm in the middle of a thought on the other hand i'm willing to give that up for um being able to have a community a really strong community and a collaborative community um, that I really love. So I'm willing to make those compromises. Some people, as I said, can't make those compromises and that's just fine. But I think we as artists need to understand what our compromises can be and what they can't be. Because I think as we get deeper into our, the way we want to create, those values become greater and greater. And those values can really make a difference when you are thinking about, okay, now, who's interested in my work? Why are they interested in my work? Can I, can I actually have conversations with these people who are interested in my work? And sometimes people have a very difficult time with the prospective buyers because they're not that, artists are not, as, are not open to some of the people that are interested in their works. In other words, collectors may not be the people that you want to hang around with. So you have to think about those things, I think, before you create your goals. In my book, I give a lot of examples of alternatives, and there's some really interesting ones. I think, I think the, most, um, uh, the most foreign one to me are the um, art farm collectives, which are really interesting. Farmers collaborating with artists, and there's a wonderful um, farm art collaborative, collaborative in California, uh, where they, um, they have collective um, um, meals together, the farmers pull together their produce, they invite community, community comes and um, artists are invited as well. And the proceeds, um, the artwork is, given, is, is um, given away, but the proceeds for the collective meal is divided equally between all the artists that have contributed artwork. I thought that was extremely interesting. There's one up, uh, there's another art um, farm collective in um, Pennsylvania that's in the book that's quite 
involved. They have puppetry, puppet shows. They also do um, uh, events, street events, uh, theater events, as well as this art farm exchange. In other words, you can get an artwork with your um, box of produce, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> there's another woman in it that, um, that there's another example. I'll give you these two examples because they're so interesting, quite different. She's um, a solo, you know, she's, she's obviously figured out that she's not really somebody that wants to work with a lot of people. She's out in the um, hinterlands. She's out in the woods in uh, Washington state. Um, and she has built her entire um, artistic life as well as economic life on the color uh, burnt sienna. <laughs> it's just one color. Her website is fabulous. So she collects burnt sienna, which is a, a mineral that you can go around and collect. And apparently, depending on where you collect this burnt sienna, the color will differ, which makes sense because it's, an, it's a mineral. So um, she has many, many variations of burnt sienna. She has said and at writes about this as this is her passion in life, this is her life quest to find as many different variations of burnt sienna, just one color, that she also uses in her artwork. She uses other colors as well, but burnt sienna is a major focus. Um, and she sells burnt sienna. So she's um, created a business for herself. And she's built a website, international website, of all these scientists, naturalists, environmentalists that go and collect burnt sienna <laughs> samples for her all over the world and then give her uh, this uh, sent her the sample, which she then posts and tells people where this particular type of burnt sienta is. So these are these are really interesting um, ways of going and thinking. It, these are pretty extreme. These are I'm giving you extreme, but there's so many other ways that you can go um, in terms of alternative paths. One is obviously the collective gallery. One is uh, another is. Um, building a, coll a collaborative gallery. There's a, a wonderful uh, ABC No Rio in New York City is a well-established alternative space. Um, they do shows that are, um, are community-based. And the interesting thing they do is the curator, or rather the director, Steve Englander, will actually pay the artist to show in the gallery. So it's a very different model. And that's what I'm really interested in. And that's what the book is really all about is different models. It also takes on just two big, very, very big issues in the art field. And I don't know if this is something that, um, that you have, uh, that, you know, we, I, I don't think this is something that we often think about as well, alternative paths for artists, as well as um, thinking about what is professionalism? Because um, professionalism is thrown around so much, being a professional artist, what does that mean? What's a professional artist here? Are you a professional artist? You know, And the minute you start to say, who's a professional artist? All of that, all of what I talked about in the beginning about galleries and high-end galleries and da-da-da-da, all that falls in. Are you successful enough? Are you famous? Are you this? Are you that? Well, professionalism is, is a very interesting word and I did some research on it. Um, and it really started in the 19th century. It was used for, um, as a way for immigrants, interestingly enough, and it's written in the book, um, a, a way for immigrants to actually be a part of the professional world without having to um, rise through the ranks of um, apprenticeship. So it was a really different model initially for um, craftspeople, for artists, for, um, uh, for people who knew, who had any kind of, um, uh, any kind of um, skill to actually then be able to say, this is my skill. It doesn't matter where I came from. It doesn't matter what social class I'm from. It doesn't matter who I am. So long as my skill is good enough for what you need me to do. 
that's when you were called a professional. Now in the 70s, 60s and 70s, professionalism was taken over, unfortunately, and skewed by um, larger institutions. And that's when professionalism became a stratified um, system. Initially, it was really to make people, to bring people into the workforce as equals. And then it became uh, a more, uh, you have to climb the ladder to become a professional, which I think is where we're stuck now in thinking about professional in very small ways, um, especially in the arts. I'm not talking about any other field, but in the arts. Um, an MFA is a terminal degree, but then I'm always thinking I'm in an MFA program, teaching in an MFA program, and I'm thinking, so what does that really mean? Which is a constant question that I go over all that all the time. What does an what does a terminal good degree really mean? Um, so I talk about professionalism in this in the in the um, book, and there are two other things that are running through the, the the discourse of the field, and those two are entrepreneurship and being in a business. One of the big things um, now everybody is saying is, oh, artists are entrepreneurs because they're they're really the first time you've sold um, an artwork, you're in a business. And I'm thinking. Uh, you know, entrepreneurship is kind of different from being in a business or having a business. Entrepreneurship, and I define the two in the book very clearly. Entrepreneurship is something that I have tried four, five, six times and not been able to do it. Instead, I've been able to write a book, which is great. But entrepreneurship um, is really about a new, new model, a new system. It's about starting something from nothing. Um, it's great. And if you can do it, fantastic. But it's very different from a business, which is has a different set of, of uh, criteria to run a business. And um, entrepreneurship has a different set of criteria. So uh, it's a big uh, sort of nice, juicy idea running around in schools, in art schools and outside art schools these days. Um, but it really needs to be well defined and so that you don't have the burden of thinking that, oh, I have to be a good entrepreneur to be an artist. No, you can easily be in business as an artist and not have the burden of being um, a sort of souped up, ramped up entrepreneurial endeavor, which unfortunately our programs are starting in schools now. Artists as entrepreneur. Anyway, so I explore that idea. And then I go, um, the last thing that I want to just um, add, and I hope I haven't talked about too many things. I'm trying to keep it kind of simple. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about are some of the dreams that we have as artists. And so in the last part of the book, I put what ifs. And those what ifs are things like, um, you know, what if artists were paid <laughs> to be in their studios to create? What if we were thought of as I, really the people who love to work with uh, interesting and different ideas like writers and poets and, you know, so many people in the arts field, in, in any field, actually, I'm thinking. Um, COVID has definitely changed the medical world and the little bits that I'm reading about that. The, the doctors and nurses and um, frontline workers are having to improvise and be creative and think in different terms every single day, every single hour. So what if there isn't a way for us as a society to really support these endeavors, these environments and say, wow, we do need these ideas. We do, we, we um, must have these new ideas. So, the NEA used to do this, the National Endowment for the Arts, used to actually um, fund, they've been cut quite a bit, and I hope they go back to a robust uh, budget at some point. But they, most of our very, very well-known artists came out of small arts communities all over the country in the 40s, 50s, 60s, because the NEA funded small little dance groups in teeny little towns in, in Kansas and in Nebraska and Iowa in Michigan. They would fund um, small galleries, small community galleries. 
And so many artists got their start that way. I know writers have gotten their starts in smaller arenas and then gone to larger and larger ones. And that's something in my sort of what if wish. <laughs> but I, I, I would hope that artists also can get involved in the civic conversations. And that's something that we don't do very well. It's something that we have, we sort of think, oh, if we get involved in too many policy issues or too many political issues, that we might, it might take away from our creativity. But I think if, if artists became just a teeny, if we each became just a teeny bit more involved in our community civic um, lives, eh, we might promote the arts a little bit more. We might create that space where we could all really thrive in. Right now, this country, unfortunately, only pays about compared to European countries, it's some, the last time I looked, it was something like we, we spend about 57 cents per person for the arts, whereas in Europe, it's more like five to eight dollars per person. Some countries go over ten dollars per person for the arts. So somehow we have to, and this is my what if um, dream, we have to centralize our creativity a little bit more and give it some a lot more do. So I've gone from micro to macro, <laughs> and I hope that's been a little bit helpful, but that is pretty much how the book runs through. And um, at the end, I, I really encourage artists to go back into, again, thinking about how to take control of their lives. What makes, what, what environments can you create for yourself that will continue to promote your creativity? whatever it is, um, and not take, the, take the, um, the standard narratives that we have out there that, you know, uh, you're not creative enough if you don't do X, or you're not, um, you're not uh, important enough if you don't do Y. So how do you create that space and what kind of goals do you have? Because I think once you've defined the goals for your practice, you will and can achieve those goals. And I wanna say one last thing about um, this endeavor. We are wicked good networkers, but I don't think we think of ourselves as good networkers. Um, Harvard, did, Harvard did a restudy a couple of years ago about the, four de uh, the six degrees of separation. And apparently in a Harvard study, it's now four degrees of separation. So whomever we really do want to get in touch with, uh, I think we can do it. I really do. I've seen it certainly with one member of this audience who picks up the phone and <laughs> Scott Siebold, who picks up the phone and calls whomever he really wants to talk to. Uh, case in point, I was uh, having a struggling uh, a couple summers ago, and um, Scott knew that there was a particular artist, June Leaf, that I loved. And so he picked up the phone, called her, she was up in Nova Scotia, and um, we ended up driving 900 miles to see her. Um, and she was, she welcomed us. Uh, she was a little bit kind of overwhelmed by the fact that we, she didn't know who we were. but she was very um, accommodating and I had a wonderful, incredible afternoon with her. But I have to tell you the funny part of the story is that we drove all the way back and then we found out that she actually winters in New York City where we are. So <laughs> we drove 900 miles to see her. We were ambitious. <laughs> anyway, so can I just, um, I, I know you're, are you almost done? Yes, yes, oh, I'm wrapped up, I'm wrapped up. It's a small enough group. And yes. We have some time. We could open it up because yes. Evelyn has joined us. Oh, Evelyn! Great. Mute her. <laughs> Can we Where hear you now, Evelyn? You unmute yourself. Where is my friend? Hi! Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for for listening and 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 being supportive of my first run through. <laughs> Hi, this is great. And please, yes, ask, ask questions uh, or make comments. I'd love to hear your comments, what and you Laura, think. And all the people that have joined, oh, me, with the exception of myself, are yes. absolutely not artists. So maybe you can <laughs> talk among yourselves, because I know Evelyn has forged a, yes. a particular yes. path as an artist. I know yes. um, Scott has, and I want to hear other people's stories. If Moira, 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 yes. Moira, yes. 
and uh, now you can unmute yourselves if you Thank would, you. Lisa. Maybe could you? Can, can you hello. Oh, hello, <laughs> hi, Lisa. Hi. I can't believe this is so great, Evelyn. Yeah. Too. Wow. So, Can yes. you unmute yourself? You are. You're not muted, right? No. I'm here now. All right. Good. So. I just want to hear from, if it's okay with you, Stacey, I'd love to hear yes, other people. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm all for it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Any Ooh, comments, any ideas <laughs> from these ideas that I just threw out there? What, how did that resonate with you? What did you think? Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that um, your point about sort of looking at where you are, where you want to go, what, what are your values, all of that is really important to yeah. keep reassessing things again and again. And um, one of the things that I sit with now is that um, I'd say about five years ago, I did a major installation of work that really is like my life's work. And it's now all in boxes, just in boxes, down in the basement. Oh. So the part of me that feels like I put my heart and soul into these things, and yes, it was a great show, and yes, a lot of people saw it, but then, what do you do? You know, it's sort of like, wow. what, what do you do then to keep on going, you know, and say, I'll create new pieces after this that will go in boxes again in the basement. It's just, um, it's an interesting thing for artists to have a buildup of work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a real challenge. And, you know, there's a lot of now, um, there, not a lot, I'm sorry. And I can send you information actually about this. There are a couple of programs that are documentation programs uh -huh. that go into an international ba a bank uh -huh. for artists with their work. Uh -huh. I think, Evelyn, you would be the perfect person to, to explore those avenues. Yeah, that's not that yeah, and it is, it is something that documentation is certainly something we all struggle with all right, the time, right. documentation. Right, right. And then, and I'm telling my students all the time, document, 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 you're gonna lose things, you're gonna misplace things, things are gonna dis be destroyed, they're gonna get moldy, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you name it, it'll happen to <laughs> it. So yeah, documentation yeah. is really important. I also am in the photography department and what I've seen these students do, which is really interesting and many, professional photographers is they make a book of their work. Uh -huh. They they make sure their photographs will never be forgotten <laughs> because they all make and they make books very Lisa's nodding, right, Lisa? Yeah. yeah. And it's fascinating because they start really early. They do it in their twenties. I mean yeah. they're I'm like, you're making a book? Wow. You're barely, you're barely out of the crib. <laughs> But they're making books really. <laughs> yeah, no, they're making, helpful. yeah, they're 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 starting to really pull their works together and say, "This is my body of work up to a certain point. My next body of work, you right. know, will be another thing." Lisa, do you have you d made a book or are you? Yeah, I well, several years ago, um, I actually created a website to try and sell some of my work. Some. Right. photographs some photographs of paintings and things like that and it really didn't go very well you know because I don't advertise I didn't do any of the work to sell like we were when you were talking about entrepreneurs being oh being a great entrepreneur forget that <laughs> um but yeah and then I made I, and I actually made books so that if I was going to a um Great. Local fair or something, people could leaf through the books mm -hmm. and decide, do you want that? And I would, you know, offer it as a print or as a framed print or whatever. Um, and then eventually, I just realized that I'm even after, like I said, showing in a space and everything. It, it, I I love the concept of creating and not so much selling. And um, so I wanted the reason I joined this this particular discussion was to hear what you had to say because I think that, that it's important for artists in general to feel confident that you can try new things and not be stuck. So thank you for your your discussion because I really liked what you had to say. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I am I am really passionate about this because I see so many students leave school stuck in this mold of, you know, 
I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And then I see them, you know, I follow, I've, I've you know, gotten to the age where they're starting to become 40. <laughs> Some of my students, it's a little scary. And, um, and I see them, you know, I see them kind of peter out and get discouraged, you know, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're fabulous creators and it just breaks my heart. So I'm trying to create these, you know, alternative paths to really um, say, hey, you know, uh, make these decisions and reassess constantly. I think you're absolutely right, Evelyn, because we change courses in our lives. And, you know, um, oh, I put on my outline, but I didn't tell you. <laughs> One of the reasons I, been, I also started thinking about this was because I was sitting in a meeting, a very high-end meeting in New York of, you know, all these directors of these crazy, interesting programs. And one of them said, um, he said there, he just sat there and he said, I'll never forget it. He said, I'm a lapsed, lapsed painter. And it really <laughs> shocked me. It really shocked me because I thought, wow, we have no labels for ourselves. You yeah. know, I, I loved that he said he was a lapsed painter because it meant that he had lapsed, but it didn't mean that he was there forever. It didn't mean that he had to stay a non-painter. And as a matter of fact, I followed up with him years later and he's painting again. But the, yeah, but the fact he gave himself that space, that permission to not feel like, oh, if I stop making things now, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not an artist. And that really helped me because I stopped making art for 10 years to write my dissertation. And I, and he, when I heard that lapsed, I was sort of in the middle of it and I was feeling guilty. I was thinking, oh, I was getting more and more uncreative. I was thinking of myself as a real loser. I was thinking like, you know, I haven't worked in so many years. I'm, you know, I'm never going to get back to it. There's not a possibility because I hadn't taken that narrative where you create, you create, you create, you create, you create, and you keep getting, you know, you can keep getting bigger and better and bigger and better. And, and he allowed me to just say to myself, I'm, um, I gave myself a label, actually. I said I was, um, oh, I can't remember the label, but it was, it was something where it allowed me the space not to work, but didn't cut off being able to go back. And now I'm deep in my studio. I love it. It's taken me a little bit to get back in there. I'm a little bit still, um, a little bit, you know, shaky in it, but I'm getting those muscles back and it feels oh. fantastic. But if I hadn't allowed myself a different kind of, I'm still an artist, I'm still a creator, but I'm not working at the moment, I couldn't have gone back in. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have. I would have just said, I'm not an artist, forget it. I'm, pfft, it's not gonna happen ever again because I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't do it the right way. And that's what I'm, that's Evelyn and Lisa, what you're, you guys are talking about, the right way, you know? And there is no right way. There is no right way. There's none. And it, it's also good to allow yourself um, a practice, a practice space, you know, like, you know, it doesn't have to be every piece comes out perfect. Like, I just want to try this new medium or I want to try this new option. Yeah. Oh, gosh, no. Oh, no. In fact, I think one of my uh, big mentors is sitting right here, Scott Siebel, because he yeah, said- Yeah, I wanted to bring him up. <laughs> He's an incredible example of a working artist, and I don't want it, our session to lapse without hearing from him, even though he probably hates me for bringing it up. <laughs> Can you say something about what you do? Which okay, hi, I'm Scott. Um, yeah, hi. Thank you uh, 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 for asking this. But anyway, so yeah, so I had two comments, one of which is that Stacy has helped me. Um, Stacy has helped me understand the difference between what I do and what I want to do. Like what I do is the stuff I come in and I, I make this stuff when I'm in the studio and I do this stuff and I feed the cat and I go upstairs and I work on this and I work on that. And I'm like driven by one color. I make a batch of color up and it goes on everything. Um, and then there's stuff that I, I want to do. My brain says, I, I want to make this. I want to do this kind of work. I want to do this. And Stacy over the years has made me like because she's in my studio a lot, sometimes more than I like. Um, <laughs> she'll not at all, never. But you know, she'll notice something, and because this is what you're doing, like, and you trust that voice. It's not a critical voice. It's an observational voice. 
and saying, this is what you're doing. And I think that it's really interesting that we, um, for myself, that I'm trying to like have that moment where I come into the studio, climb the stairs and I enter in and I, and I have that 15 seconds of being able to act like I don't know me and I'm able to look at me for a second and then me comes running at me and starts getting back inside of me so I can see, you know, then I, all my anticipations, wants, wishes and desires of my artwork come pouring back in. But I try to get those moments where I find out what I do that has sustained me more than what I want to do. And if, I don't know if that's explaining it or not, but it's the kind of stuff that I do when I'm in the studio, the stuff I make that like Joni Mitchell says or whoever said it or whatever, it's what you do while you're not, you're doing other things. You know, while I'm planning to, you know, repaint Guernica, you know, um, I, I've, I'm making this other thing, you know, I'm doing this other thing. And that other thing is what I do. But then my brain is over here, you know, thinking about that. And so that's been really helpful uh, with Stacey's first book. And then, you know, being around for the second has been a lot about that. Um, the other one is a split in the conversation that was really interesting. It's like one of which is like um, how to give yourself permission to make. And then once you're making, what do you do with all your make? Right. Right. You know, you got all this make stuff. Right. And uh, and and I think that's really interesting. And I, I, too, am suffering. The downstairs is now a storage area. It used to be a place where I could make other paintings, but uh -huh. now it's stuff. And uh, but that's also this sounds really sick, but it's true. It allowed me to slow down um, and not feel this kind of urgency to create I'm like I'm there I mean I'm there for two hours but sometimes I have anxiety when I'm in the studio to make I'm not getting anywhere what are you doing you're just sitting around and I'm, it's not that I'm okay I do read and the gat a lot but still or fall asleep or take a nap I'm giving away all my trade secrets um <laughs> but, but that that the, knowing that I've got a body of work behind me whatever the hell it is whatever it looks like whatever it is I've got 20 that I could say I did that and I can put those on my website and I can say that I did that. Um, it allows me to slow down a little bit and feel that I could open up and let that thing that came up the stairs and had that 15 seconds to look at maybe come out and, and paint a little bit or do a little work as opposed to my frontal lobe telling me that I need to do master works and I need to, you know, be much more aware of what the hell is going on in the art world, read an art, you know, get a picture, you know, and all that. That thing that's always there in my studio, like what's going on in the rest of the world, but now that I can somehow think I have a few paintings under my belt that I can go look at, <laughs> how many art, I would like to know, how many artworks people have out there in the world, like, what the hell happened to that thing? <laughs> I have so many artworks that I'm like, I don't think I sold that. Where, where are they, right? Everyone's nodding, right? They're like, <laughs> I don't know what happened, you know? I, don't know. I must leave a lot of stuff like paint over. I don't know. But anyway, so that's enough for me. But thank you very much. Um, can, I, uh, can I just say one thing, Scott? Very in, thanks. Scott has a full-time job teaching AP art at New Rochelle High. And he teaches like a dog all the time. He's, got, he's working on his second master's in art history. So he's also a student. He's got a very active studio life. Many people have Scott's art around them. And um, <laughs> he's, he's, you know, I, of anybody I know, I know. Now, I'm not an artist, so I don't know many. But um, aside from Stacy and Evelyn, um, I, I, I don't know anybody who works as hard as you do at, at every angle of art. Right. Well, one thing that's really good, and Moira's here. I teach with Moira at Michelle High School. And uh, it really, you know, and this is on teaching end, and Stacy knows this, that as... I, I, okay, so they told me don't teach until you've got a few years under your belt, you know, uh, as out there in the world as an artist, get your studio practice set up, and plus I was an idiot, so no one would listen to me, anyway, or hire me, <laughs> but now that you're a teacher, you know, I have find so much energy, and I know Moira's like this too, the energy comes back, you bring that back to your studio, and you use them, I mean, and then if, and then this is really great, if you don't, can't figure something out in the studio, bring it to your students, That's <laughs> It out. I do it all the time. I had this whole thing with knots and ropes and stuff. I had them drawing knots and ropes for two years. <laughs> so Let's do that. Let they're like you're like you're like seventy five artist assistants in an 
building. Now they're virtual, but they're still your assistants, yeah. But Scott said a couple things. Can I, can I, Marion, jump in here? Sure, yeah. Susie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Scott said a couple things so that I think are really interesting and I think they are relevant. And Moira, please jump in because you've got and, and, a and lot Evelyn of- And also has a very complex practice that I'd like- I was to just going to say, but all of, you know, we've got some really great artists here. Um, that, well, I, what I wanted to say on a very practical level, and Lisa, it was, it, i bouncing off of something you said. Um, Scott's taught me to just go into the studio or wherever I'm working or whatever I'm doing for like even five minutes. And it's really strange. I, I have done my best work when I've said Scott's been waiting in the car. I go feed the cat because we have a studio cat, which gets us there every day. Everybody needs a studio cat. <laughs> and because um, um, we have to feed them and I'll have like, I'll say 10 minutes and then I'll have five minutes to do something. And sometimes because of that, pressure that quick um, um, need to make a decision. I'll make a decision that if I have a lot of time will take me forever. And it's a very interesting dynamic. I, Scott's really taught me that. Tim Gunn, who I don't know, you know, the big uh, fashion fellow, um, fashion fellow. I worked with Tim Gunn at Parsons I, and he was wonderful. Hello. Really a, a, a mensch, an incredible human being. Um, uh, but he always said to everybody, you know, 15 minutes every day, if you can, um, but really try 15. He, he does 15, I say, anywhere between two and, you know, 10, <laughs> two minutes and 10 hours, <laughs> whatever you could do. Um, but, and, and I didn't say this, but I think it might be a, the time to say something about this. I think, um, you know, yeah, setting out your goals, and I think is really important. But I also think um, having that understanding and faith as to why you're doing what you're doing. Evelyn, you can talk about this. You've been at it for so long, and that you've been so committed to your work um, in amongst your in the rest of your life. I mean, it's been really amazing what you've done. No, oh, thank can, you. Can you say a few things about that? I, I guess um, for me, there's no real separation between my life and my art and uh, the students that I have and you know my kids, everybody around me. Um, my house is my, my art. <laughs> I um, saw it, yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I, I grew up in a family where, you know, my mother was happy if I could draw the toaster, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> and that was like her exciting thing that I would do. But I, I, I feel like, for me, my students feed me as far as like my energy. And I really, I try to take from them their ability to play a lot in the studio. Nice. And so then I, when I'm by myself, I might just go back in and, and clear everything off and just start playing. You know, just- Yeah, that's no, nice. No focus on anything, just yes. play, play with the colors, play with the shapes, keep yes. making canvases and yes. not necessarily know what's going where, whatever, but yes. just have that, training in your mind you're like I'm, I'm creating I'm doing something yeah yeah, yeah. and and just taking on new projects when I can you're like just waiting for somebody to come to me with a, with a project and usually at this point in my life uh, some nice things have come this way you know just wow yeah, that's fantastic not, not for money not for money yeah. but for, for you know for the excitement of doing them yeah well yeah. you know you know as I know Scott Scott and I are surrounded by art books and artists stories and lives and etc and for every one artist that we know there are multitude of artists doing the same thing just yeah. as well yeah. and it's just it's just the weirdest set of circumstances that one pops up above everything else and it's 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 a fluke it's usually a fluke the rest right. of us you know we do it because um, I love Willie Nelson has a great line. Somebody said, well, why are you still making music? You know, you're, mm. you're a hundred and something at this point. I don't know how old he is. <laughs> and he, I love his one line. He shot back immediately. He said, because it feels good. Uh -huh. This, that wonderfully, and it does. It just feels so good. It feels so good. Um, Gerhard Richter, who's the um, a German, very, very well-known German painter uh, said something that I find I'm, I'm thinking about quite a bit now because I I just heard it recently I, uh, and I 
I don't know what I think of it, but I think it's really quite wonderful. He said, art is the highest form of hope. Mm. Yeah, it's really, I thought, really beautiful. And especially nowadays, art is the highest form of hope. It's a very interesting relationship of words. Um, I would initially think about it either way, but when you do, it's like, yeah, it is. And it probably cool. sounds even better in German. Yeah. <laughs> He's German. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've heard that about gardening. Oh, gardening, yes. Gardening. Just That's because beautiful. you plant the seed with the hope that it'll... Yeah, it'll yeah. And it's the miracle. I've yeah. never gotten over that a seed can become what it does. I just, yeah. that's just mind boggling still to me. Yeah. yeah. Is I there think, any... Oh, oh, go ahead. I think that for me, you know, when I'm listening to people who physically make beautiful things with paintbrushes, I, I think my art is being in the garden. Yeah. And the miracle of the garden and lots yeah. of it is an art. It is an art. You know, and, and in that, I think that's really interesting because Stacy, share at, at, at a community garden as well as Marion is, and I'm sure a few of you are, are it's funny, that sense of, um, it's not the word correctness, but there's a sense of feeling that when I leave the garden, um, I brought everything back to like, a, like everything's okay. Like everything's mm -hmm. the okay. Like it's not, some things live, some things die, whatever. I've done the best I can. And when I leave the studio on a really good day, I kind of feel that same thing. I don't feel like, yeah, I knocked it out of the park. Andy Warhol, move over. I mean, <laughs> I don't have that. I never have that. But I have that same feeling when I leave the garden. You know, I've got a little stuff to eat. You know, I've got a little whatever and things are growing. And there's that sense of, I don't know the word. It's the reason it's art. I think, so. I think the word for me is grounding. Oh, yeah. yes. But, oh, yes. But, and art does I'm not that. I'm going into a studio, but if I go into the garden for 10 minutes and I think, I just have 10 minutes. Right. Yeah. 10 minutes. That's the same thing. Everybody here, I know Moira, I know everyone we're looking at feels the same thing. Go downstairs, go to the go to the studio, whatever you do, I need it. In fact, your mate probably looks at you and says, you need to go to the <laughs> You, you got to get out of here. Yeah. You got to go to the garden and get out of here. Go get ground. Yeah, Diane, Diane, I just wanted to say one thing about your gardening is like watching you in the garden and experiencing you in it, like pulling all your pieces together mm. and then bringing it into the kitchen and then creating. Like oh, yes. An incredible salad or something that's gorgeous mm. in color and smell. It, it's like, it is a studio experience. You know? yeah. and and also, I just said Diane, I was going to say she also was used to and she could pick it up in a second. She's a pot and incredible. Well, that's potter. <laughs> oh, that's yes. Like quilt stop. Don't talk. Don't <laughs> <laughs> on mute, Mary. Word for the library. I'm telling somebody not to talk. Um, she's a quilter. She is a. You know, yes. A, I actually, Diane. I still have some of your pots. Do you? I do too. <laughs> yes. Forty pounds each. <laughs> yes, they're sturdy. They're sturdy. I remember when Mary said, I like these. They're nice and heavy. Like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but too, it's, I think you, you physically are an artist in different and different medium. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's it. And Moira, can I ask you, since we're here, what do you, are you a painter? What am I, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Please tell her. I do that. Scott, you're first, mute. First of all, first of all, she's a thinker extraordinary. And I think, you know, as much as you um, work a lot in photography in the image, as uh, someone said, what is photography? It's whatever you see through a lens. So I think that might be something that's close to. But also, there's a great amount of sewing that Ms. McCall does. Um, do you have an example for us? No, you guys will think I'm a freak, but okay. Well, I'm, yeah! I'm going to out you as oh, one. On! <laughs> she does great sock monkeys, but they take them to a new level. You have a little vernissage of our Rasputin, maybe we might have. Yeah. yeah. No, I um I I I'm, I do drawing, painting, um, printmaking, um, photography stuff, and <laughs> making of sock monkeys. Really? That wasn't a joke. No, no I'm taking it. No, no, I'm actually no, during, during teaching my photo two class, we I make them with my, my photography two and my PAVE kids. And we didn't have a chance to make we make them their last year with me and they didn't have a chance. So we've been making them virtually. 
online, which is crazy. But we did. But there's my guy. Oh, cool. <laughs> so cute. There's such a around. I want a close up. That's oh. his back. It's Rasputin, the, the priest at the Russian cross. Oh, wow. Whoa. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> Oh, Stacey, awesome. I know he scares you. Yeah, he does. <laughs> no question about that. Sock monkeys have always scared me. I don't know why. I just never grew up with them. <laughs> Whatever, Stacy. <Whatever. laughs> Moira. But Moira, I have to say, Moira also, Moira does, I, I think that multimedia um, that Moira does is, is um, also something, I mean, I want to go back just for one second, that... Um, and you've given me a really interesting idea, Mara, because one of the things that doesn't happen very easily in the art world is our artists that are multimedia people, you know, that we work across different mediums, they can't handle it. It's like you get one thing and then you keep going. I'm thinking of Sean Skelly, who does stripes, and the poor guy has been doing stripes for what, let's got now, 40 years? Wow. Because his gallery wants stripe paintings. <laughs> and I look at his stripe paintings now and I go, oh my God, the poor it's guy is dying. It's he's ironic, dying. like he's jailed. Yes, yeah. yes, Diane. And it feels like that when I look at his current paintings. They're just like, they're, they're horrifying to me because he's just been doing them for so long. And that's, you know, that's what we give up. And I think sometimes we don't have a robust enough conversation about these, the, what we're saying when we throw out, oh, or, you know, where are you in the art world, all that stuff. What you give up for what you get, sometimes to me, I was trying to explain it before, may not be really that great. <laughs> it really may not be. I want to ask really quickly, Lisa, what's your medium? Lisa. I got there. I'm, I had to unmute. I, I mute because my husband's back there working and I don't want to okay. have that oh, cover conversation. But um, actually, I, I am kind, mostly uh, self-taught. I've done some art school or whatever, but I do photography mm -hmm. um, and painting and some sketching but lately when you talk about multimedia or whatever I've been exploring trying different things and to be honest with you because of the pandemic or whatever and missing family I've decided to start building little um little tiny toy fairy home kind of things out of seashells and birdhouses and and mm. poured medium paint on them and and stuff for my nieces and my granddaughter and and mixing things up like taking photographs and cutting them out and creating paintings and then collages uh on top of it with pieces of photographs and and just playing like taking parts of the nature that we can't get putting it all together and framing it and um with seashells and and pieces of of plants and things and just trying to express you know, I guess it's the, you know, being caged up feeling <laughs> and I want to express out yes. and none of this is to be sold or anything. It's more just an expression right now. You know, yeah. I just, like I said, I shut down our, co our company. We, we had, you know, we had a company, we named it and everything and um, just shut it all down and decided to just do for myself. So a lot of what you guys are talking about that five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever Sometimes they, those five, 10 minutes turns into hours, but it's such a good feeling at the oh, yeah. end. Like, like Scott had said, you, you, you're not creating a masterpiece, but you are creating a masterpiece of what's inside of you. Absolutely. That, you know, it's not a masterpiece to maybe, you know, some famous art critic, but to what's inside of you and to the love that you're pouring into it for the little ones in my life who I am so excited that I am, you know, teaching my granddaughter to just be free. And she teaches me in return to just be free with whatever she's playing with and whatever the art piece is. So, yes. Thank you. That's okay. great. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's Thank I'm you. Glad. That was wonderful. I'm excited not to garden, but to play. <laughs> um, uh, Stacy, I want to thank you for coming on. And, oh, and yes, having... I know the time <laughs> flew. <laughs> thank you, Stacey. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you.
Thank you. This was so inspiring. Yeah, oh, thank you. Don't go away yet. Don't go away. I want to, um, Stacey, you might want to, um, let, after this, share the information about your book. But I also want to say that next Thursday, I believe it's, I don't know the exact time, but I'll get back to all of you. We have David Corns who is a local guy from Mansfield, and he was a set designer for Hamilton and the set designer for Dear Evan. I want to see that, yeah. And he, he's worked, he was there when um, Obama was on the set for Hamilton and when they talked to Mike Pence, and he's very interesting because he went from a failed actor at Mansfield High to this brilliant set designer, and he took wow. that failure and made it into something amazing. And he's got a lot of participants. I don't know that we have a limit, but I, he's, he's kind of a big star. Yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds interesting. I sign on for that because it should right. be very interesting. It's moderated, nobody gets to talk. There are pre-selected questions, all that. But yeah. because, you know, I wish I could have set the same thing up for you, Stacey. No, <laughs> totally. no, no I, I'm so grateful, actually. It's like this, I'm really grateful because we had a great conversation. Thank you, everyone. And please, um, I'm gonna give, um, Marion has all of your information, correct? You guys, okay. Because um, I'll give her, I'll give her my. Well, she can send you my information. And if you have other questions or if you're thinking about things, definitely I'm going to send you programs, um, Evelyn, for your boxes. <laughs> Great. And Tim, we didn't get to you. I hope you're still there. But um, thank you for coming. Oh, and, oh, thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Are you a? Do you? Um, are you an artist? Um. I, I'm actually working with a gentleman with a disability who's got some reservations about entering into the art world. I guess it's probably oh. that's a whole can of worms, but oh, uh, and you know, I, I just thought of that movie, My Left Foot. You know, but this this gentleman is very concerned, and I I thought maybe this would be a good resource. He's very eager, yes. but he, he's he's saying, well, when I want to draw something, it doesn't look like what I want it to look like. And yes, uh, he's at the he's at the he's in the initial stages, as we say. He's in the initial yes. stages. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be in contact with him. So you can send Mary in his information. Yeah, and also and, this is recorded and it'll be downloaded by ECAT, East End Community Access Television. So you can, you can hook it, you can be, this'll, you'll get information about the, how to access the recording if we want to go back, if anybody wants to go back to this. I thought it was great to have a, a whole conversation with people. Thank you. Yes, you well, couldn't do this with a huge group. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, and I'll send information to Mary and she can send it out. Okay. Thanks guys. Thank Good to see everybody. Bye. Lots of love. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Hang on. Hi, Marion. <laughs>